chapter here on the campus and the students and faculty and friends. I would like to start out by thanking uh, those who are responsible for our being here for the invitation to speak here on the campus at Michigan State University and to express our views on what we feel is America's uh, most serious problem, the race problem. And it should be pointed out at the outset that I represent the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, whose followers are known as the Muslims here in America, and actually are the fastest growing group, fastest growing religious group uh, among black people anywhere in the West, uh, Western Hemisphere. And it is our intention to try and spell out what the philosophy and aims uh, and motivations of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad happened to be in his solution to this very serious problem that America finds herself confronted with. And I might point out, too, that if you don't think that the problem is serious, then you need only to listen to the Attorney General, uh, Robert F. Kennedy, in almost every speech he's been involved in, especially during the past few months, and even today, he has pointed out that the race problem is the America's most serious domestic problem. And since the problem is so serious, it's time to take some serious steps to get to the factors that create this problem. And again, I want to thank the African Students Association and the, NAA, and the campus NAACP for displaying the unity necessary to bring a very controversial issue uh, before the students here on campus. The unity of Africans abroad and the unity of Africans here in this country can bring about practically any kind of achievement or accomplishment that black people want today. And when I say the Africans abroad and the Africans here in this country, the man that you call a Negro is nothing but an African himself. But some of them have been brainwashed into thinking that Africa is a, a place with no culture, no history, no contribution to civilization or science, so many of these Negroes, they uh, take offense when they're identified with their homeland. But today we want to point out the different types of Negroes that you have to deal with. And once you, once you know there's more than one type, then you won't come up with just one type solution. Uh, the, and to point out how timely the invitation uh, is or was, I don't want to read newspapers to you, but in the uh, Detroit News, dated uh, Thursday, January the 17th. It told about the Interfaith Council uh, of, re of uh, Religion that was held in Chicago uh, last week. And uh, their, the topic of their conversation was the race problem here in America. And it pointed out that all of the uh, time that they spent and money that they spent, actually they didn't get to the meat of the issue. And in this particular uh, copy of the paper on page three, uh, the chaplain at Wayne State University actually criticized the efforts of these uh, Protestant Catholics and Jews in Chicago last week for failing to bring uh, spokesmen to that conference who really uh, would speak for black people and spell out issues that were not being spelled out by the others. And I just want to read uh, a recommendation that he made. Mr. Boyd believes that the, accomplish, that the conference might have accomplished mu much good if the speakers had included a white supremacist and a Negro race leader, preferably a top man in the American black Muslim movement. He said that a debate between them would undoubtedly be bitter, but it would accomplish one thing. Uh, it would get some of the real issues out into the open. And I think that the man is right. Most of the so-called Negroes that you listen to on the race problem usually don't represent any uh, following of black people. Usually they are Negroes who have been put in that position by the uh, white man himself. And when they speak, they're not speaking for black people. They're saying exactly what they know the white man who put them in that position wants to hear them say. So uh, again, I think that it was very uh, progressive and objective on the part of these two sponsoring groups to give us an opportunity to tell you how black people really think and how black people really feel and how dissatisfied black people have become increasingly so 
with the conditions that our people find ourselves in here in this country. Now, in speaking as a, uh, in, in professing to speak for black people, by representing the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, you want to know who does he represent, who does he speak for. He, there are two types of Negroes in this country. There's the bourgeois type who blames himself to the conditions of his people and who is satisfied with token solutions. He's, the, he's in the minority. He's a handful. He's usually the hand-picked Negro who benefits from token integration. But the masses of black people who really suffer the brunt of brutality and the conditions that exist in this country are represented by the leadership of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So when I come in here to speak to you, I'm not coming in here speaking as, an, as a, a Baptist or a Methodist or a Democrat or a Republican or a Christian or, or a Jew or not even as an American. Because if I stand up here, if I could stand up here and speak to you as an American, we wouldn't have anything to talk about. The problem would be solved. But we don't even profess to speak as an American. We are speaking as a black, I'm speaking as a black man. And I'm letting you know how a black man thinks, how a black man feels, and how dissatisfied black man should have been 400 years ago. So, and if I raise my voice, you forgive me or excuse me. I'm not doing it out of disrespect. I'm speaking from my heart. And I'll let you, and you get it exactly as the feeling brings it out. When I pointed out that there are two kinds of Negroes, some Negroes don't want a black man to speak for them. That type of Negro doesn't even want to be black. He's ashamed of being black. And you, you'll never hear him refer to himself as black. Now, that type we don't pretend to speak for. You can speak for him. In fact, you can have him. But the ones that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad speaks for are those whose uh, pattern of thinking, pattern of thought, pattern of behavior, pattern of action is being changed by what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is teaching throughout America. These are that, that mass element. And usually, when you hear the press refer to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, they refer to him as a, hate, a teacher of hate, or uh, an advocate of violence, or what's this other thing, black supremacists. Actually, this is the type of propaganda put together by the press, thinking that this will uh, alienate masses of black people uh, from what he's saying. But actually, the only one uh, whom that type of uh, propaganda alienates is this Negro who's always up in your face begging you for what you have, or begging you for a chance to live in your neighborhood, or work on your job, or uh, marry one of your women. Well, that type of Negro naturally doesn't want to hear what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is talking about. But the type that wants to hear what he's saying is the type who feels that he'll get farther by standing on his own feet and doing something for himself for solving his own problem instead of accusing you of creating the problem and, and, and then at the same time depending, depending upon you to do something to solve the problem. So you have two types of Negro, the old type and the new type. Most of you know the old type. When you read about him in history during slavery, he was called Uncle Tom. He was the house Negro. And during slavery, you had two Negroes. You had the house Negro and the field Negro. The house Negro usually lived close to his master. He dressed like his master. He wore his master's uh, secondhand clothes. He ate food that his master left on the table. Uh, and he lived in his master's house, probably in the basement or the attic, but he still lived in the master's house. So whenever that house Negro identified himself, he always identified himself in the, in the same sense that his master identified himself. When his master said, we have good food, the house Negro would say, yes, we have plenty of good food. We have plenty of good food. When the, when the master uh, said that we have a fine home here, the house Negro would say, yes, we have a fine home here. When the uh, master would be sick, the house Negro identified himself so much with his master, he'd say, what's the matter, boss? We sick? His master's pain was his pain. And it hurt him more for his master to be sick than for, for, for him to be sick himself. Well, if the house started burning down, that type of Negro would fight hard, harder to put the master's house out than the master himself would. But then you had another Negro out in the field. The house Negro was in the minority. The masses, the field Negro, were the masses. They were in the majority. When the master got sick, they prayed that he died. If his house caught on the fire, they prayed for a, rent, for a wind to come along and fan the breeze. 
If someone came to the uh, house Negro and said, let's go, let's separate, naturally that Uncle Tom would say, go where? How, where? What could I do without boss? Where would I live? How would I dress? Who would look out for me? That's the house Negro. But if you went to the uh, field Negro and said, let's go, let's separate, he wouldn't even ask you where or how. He'd say, yes, let's go. And that, that would end it right there. So now you have a 20th century type of Negro today, a 20th century Uncle Tom. He's just as much an Uncle Tom today as Uncle Tom was 100 and 200 years ago. Oh, he's a modern Uncle Tom. That Uncle Tom wore a handkerchief around his head. This Uncle Tom wears a top hat. A top hat. He's sharp. He, dress, he uh, dresses just, as, just like you do. He speaks the same phraseology, the same language. He tries to speak it better than you do. He speaks with the same accent, same diction. And uh, he, when you say uh, your army, he says our army. He had not got anybody to defend himself, to, to defend him. But any time you say we, he says we, our president, our government, our senate, our congressman, our this and our that. And he hasn't even got a, a seat in that hour, even at the end of the line. So this is the 20th century Negro. Whenever you say use the personal pronoun in the singular or in the plural, he uses it right along with you. When, he, when you say you're in trouble, he says, yes, we're in trouble. But then there's another kind of black man on the scene. If you say you're in trouble, he says, yes, you're in trouble. He doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't identify himself with your plight whatsoever. And this is the thing that the white people in America have got to come to realize, that there are two types of black people in this country. One who identifies with you so much so he will let you brutalize him and still beg you for a chance to sit next to you. And then there's one who's not interested in sitting next to you. He's not interested in being around you. He's not interested in what you have. He wants something of his own. He wants to sit someplace where he can call his own. He doesn't want a seat in your restaurant where you can give him some old bad coffee or bad food. He wants his own restaurant. And he wants some land that he can build that restaurant on in a city that that can go in. He wants something of his own. And when you realize that this type of thinking is existing and developing fastly, uh, swiftly, uh, behind the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad among the so-called Negroes, then I think you'll also realize that this whole phony effort at integration is no solution because the most you can do with this Funny effort toward in, uh, integration is to put out some token integration. And whereas this Uncle Tom will accept your token effort, the masses of black people in this country are no more interested in token integration uh, than they would be if you offered them a chance to sit inside a furnace somewhere. The only one who'll do that is this 20th century Uncle Tom. And you can always tell him because he wants to be next to you. He wants to eat with you. He wants to sleep with you. He wants to marry your woman, marry your mother, marry your sister, marry your daughter, and if you watch him close enough, he's even after your wife. <laughs> this type has blind faith in your religion. He's not interested in any religion of his own. He, has, he believes in a white Jesus, white Mary, white angels, and he's trying to get to a white heaven. When you listen to him in his church saying he sings a song, I think they call it, Wash Me White as Snow. He wants to uh, be, he wants to be turned white so he can go to heaven with a white man. It's not his fault. It's actually not his fault. But this is the state of his mind. This is the result of uh, 400 years of brainwashing here in America. You have taken a man who is black on the outside and made him white on the inside. His brain is white as snow. His heart is white as snow. And therefore, whenever you say this is ours, he thinks he's white the same as you. So what's yours, he thinks it's also his. Even right on down to your woman. Now, many of them will take uh, offense at my implying that he wants your woman. They'll say, no, this is what Bilbo and uh, Talmadge and all of the white citizens councils say. They say that to fool you. If this is not what they want, watch them. And if you find evidence to the contrary, then I'll take back my word. But all you have to do is give him a chance to get near you. And you'll find that he is not satisfied until he's sitting next to your woman or closer to her than that. So uh, what the Honorable, in this type of Negro, usually he hates black and loves white. He doesn't want to be black. He wants to be white. And he'll, you, he'll get on his bended knees and beg you for integration, which means he would rather uh, live, ra rather than live with his own kind who love him, he'll force himself to live in neighborhoods around white people whom he knows don't mean him any good. And as, again, I say, this is not his fault. He is sick. And as long as America listens to this sick Negro, 
who is begging to be integrated into the American society despite the fact that the attitude and actions of whites uh, are, are, are sufficient proof that he is not wanted, why then you are actually allowing him to force you into a position where you look just as sick as he looks. If someone holds a, a gun on a white man and makes him embrace me, put his hands, arm around me, this isn't love, nor is it brotherhood. What they're doing is forcing the white man to be a hypocrite, to practice hypocrisy. But if that white man will put his arm around me willingly, voluntarily, of his own volition, then that's love, that's brotherhood, that's a solution to the problem. Likewise, as long as the government has to get out here and legislate to force uh, Negroes into a white neighborhood or force Negroes into a white school or force Negroes into white industry and make white people pretend that they go for this, all the government is doing is making white people be hypocrites. And rather than be classified as a bigot by uh, putting a block, the average white person actually uh, 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 would rather put up, on, put up uh, a hypocritical face, the face of a hypocrite, than to tell the black man, no, uh, you stay over there and let me stay over here. So that's no solution. As long as you force people to act uh, in a hypocritical way, you'll never solve that problem. It has to be, uh, uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us that a solution has to be devised that will be satisfactory, completely satisfactory to the black man and completely satisfactory to the white man. And the only thing that makes white people completely satisfied and black people completely satisfied when they're in their right mind is when the black man has his own and the white man has his own. You have what you need, we have what uh, we need. And then both of us have something, and even the Bible says, God bless the child that has his own. And the poor so-called Negro doesn't have his own name, doesn't have his own language, doesn't have his own culture, doesn't have his own history, he doesn't have his own country, he doesn't even have his own mind. And he thinks that he's black because God cursed him. He's not black because God cursed him. He's black because, uh, rather, he's cursed because he's out of his mind. He has lost his mind. He has a white mind instead of the type of mind that he should have. So when these uh, uh, so-called Negroes who want integration try and force themselves into the white society, which doesn't solve the problem, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us that that type of Negro is the one that creates the problem. And the type of white, pe white person who perpetuates the problem is the one who poses as a liberal uh, and uh, pretends that uh, the Negro should be integrated, and as long as he integrates someone else's neighborhood. But all these whites that you see running around here talking about how liberal they are and we believe everybody should have what they want and go where they want and do what they want, as soon as the Negro moves into that white liberal's neighborhood, that white liberal, is he moves out faster than the white uh, bigot from Mississippi, Alabama, and from someplace else. So we won't solve the problem listening, listening to that Uncle Tom Negro, and the problem won't be solved listening to this so-called white liberal. The only time the problem is going to be solved is when a black man can sit down like a black man and a white man can sit down like a white man and make no excuses whatsoever with each other in discussing the problem. Uh, no offense will stem from factors that are brought up, but both of them have to sit down like men on one side and on the other side and look at it in terms of black and white and then take some kind of solution based upon the factors that we see rather than upon that which we would like to believe. And when I say that this Negro wants to force his way into the white man's family, this integrationist-minded Negro wants to force his way into the white man's family, some don't believe that. Some take issue with that. But you take all of the integrationists, all of the, uh, uh, those who are, are used to finance the program of the integrationists, the, the average so-called Negro celebrity, put all of them in one pot. And as fast as you name them off, you'll find that every one of them is married either to a white woman or a white man from Lena Horn, Ethel Kitt, Sammy Davis, and you could name them all night long. They, although they say that this is not what we want, that's what they've done. That's what they have. And, and uh, we don't, the black masses don't want what Lena Horn wants or what uh, uh, Sammy Davis wants or what, uh, who's his name, the rest of them want. Usually you'll find that before Sammy, uh, before Sammy Davis and Lena Horn and Ethel Kitt and Harry Belafonte become involved in a mixed marriage, you could go into the Negro community, anyone across the country, and find those, uh, uh, the, those stars with records on the, the jukeboxes in the Negro community. You can't walk into a Negro community today and find anybody that the Negro community knows is involved in a mixed marriage with their records uh, being popular in the Negro community, subconsciously. 
A Negro doesn't have any respect or regard or confidence or nor can he be moved by. Another black, a black man who marries a white woman or a black woman who marries a white man. And when they put out that picture to you that all of us want your woman, no, just that 20th century Uncle Tom. He wants her. And, uh, but, and, and then when you uh, uh, fulfill, think you're going to solve your problem by pleasing him, you're only making the problem worse. You have to go back and listen to the problem as it is for the black people, not by these hand-picked handful of Uncle Tom who benefit from token integration. Also, this type of so-called Negro, by being intoxicated over the white man, he never sees beyond the white man. He never sees beyond America. He never looks at himself uh, or where he fits into things on the world stage. He only can see himself here in America, on the American stage or the white stage, where the white man is in the majority, where the white man is the boss. So this type of Negro is always feels like he's outnumbered, or he's the underdog, or he's the minority. And it puts him in the role of a better, uh, a cowardly, humble, uh, uh, Uncle Tom and better on anything that he says is, uh, that sh should be his by right. Whereas well, there is, uh, when it comes, he, uh, he, he wants to be an American rather than to be black. He wants to be something other than what he is. And knowing that America is a white country, he knows he can't be uh, black and be an American too. So he never calls himself black. He calls himself an American Negro, a Negro in America. And usually he'll deny his own race, his own color, just to be a second-class American. He'll deny his own history, his own culture. He'll deny all of his brothers and sisters in Africa, in Asia, in the East, just to be a second-class American. He denies everything that he represents, or that everything that was in his past, just to be uh, uh, accepted into a country and into a government that has rejected him ever since he was brought here. Well, this Negro is sick. He has to be sick to try and force himself among some people who don't want him, or to be accepted into a government that has used this entire political system and educational system to keep him relegated to, a, to the role of a second-class citizen. And therefore, he spends a lifetime begging for acceptance into the same government that made slaves of his people. He gives his life for a country that made his people slaves and still confines them to the role of second-class citizens. And we feel that he wastes his time begging white politicians, political hypocrites, for civil rights or for some kind of first-class citizenship. He's like a, a watchdog or a hound dog. Uh, you may run into a dog. No matter how vicious a dog is, you find him out in the street, he won't bite you. But when you get him up on the porch, he will growl. He'll take your leg. Now, that dog, when he's out in the street, only his own life is threatened. And, because, and he's never been trained to protect himself. He's only been trained by his master to think in terms of what's good for his master. So when you catch him in the street and, and you threaten him, he'll go around you. But when you come up on the, through the gate when he's sitting on the master's porch, then he'll bear his things and get ready to bite you. Not because you're threatening him, but because you're threatening his master who has trained him not to protect himself, but to protect the property of the master. And this type of 20th century Uncle Tom is the same way. He'll never attack you, but he'll attack me. I can run into him out in the street and blast him. He won't say a word. But if I look like I'm about to blast you in here, he'll open up his mouth and put up a better defense for you than you can put up for yourself. Because he hasn't been trained to defend himself. He has only been trained to open up his mouth in defense of his master. He hasn't been educated. He's been trained. When a man is educated, he can think for himself and defend himself and speak for himself. But this 20th century Uncle Tom Negro never opens up his mouth in defense of a black man. He opens up his mouth in defense of the white man, in defense of America, in defense of the American government. He doesn't even know where his government is because he doesn't know that he ever had one. He doesn't know where his country is because he doesn't know that he ever had one. He believes in exactly what he was taught in school, that when he was kidnapped by the white man, he was a savage in the jungle someplace eating, eating people and throwing spears and with a bone in his nose. And the average American Negro has that concept of the African continent. It is not his fault. This is what has been given to him by the American educational system. He doesn't realize that there were civilizations and cultures on the African continent at a time when the people in Europe were crawling around in the caves going naked. He doesn't realize that the black man in Africa was wearing silk, was wearing slippers that he was able to spin himself, make himself, 
at a time when the people up in Europe were going naked. He doesn't realize that he was living in palaces in, on the African continent when the people in Europe were living in caves. He doesn't realize that he was living in a civilization in Africa where uh, science had been so far advanced, especially even the astronomical sciences, to a point where Africans could cut the course of the stars in the universe when the people up in Europe still thought the Earth was round, the planet was round or flat. He doesn't realize the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the advancement and the high state of his own culture that he was living in before he was kidnapped and brought to this country by the white man. He, he knows nothing about that. He knows nothing about the ancient Egyptian civilization on the African continent, or the ancient Carthaginian civilization on the African continent, or the ancient uh, civilizations of Mali on the African continent, civilizations that were highly developed and produced science, scientists. Uh, the uh, Timbuktu, the center of the Mali Empire, was the center of learning at a time when the people up in Europe didn't even know what a book was. He doesn't, he doesn't know this because he hasn't been taught. And because he doesn't know this, when you mention Africa to him, well, he thinks you're talking about a jungle. And I went to Africa uh, uh, in 1959 and didn't see any jungle and didn't see any mud huts until I got back to Harlem in New York City. <laughs> so you're familiar with that type of Negro. And the, the, the black man that you're not familiar with is the one that we would like to point out now. He is a new, he's the new type. He's the type that seldom the white man ever comes in contact with. And when, when you do come in contact with him, you're shocked because you didn't know that this type of black man existed. And immediately you think, well, here's one of those black supremacists or racists or extremists who believe in violence and all that old kind of, well, that's what they call it. <laughs> this new type of black, he do not want integration. He wants separation. Not segregation, separation. To him, segregation, as we're taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, means that which is forced upon inferiors by superiors. A segregated community is a Negro community. But the white community, though it's all white, it's never called a segregated community, it's a separate community. In the white community, the white man uh, controls the economy, his own economy, his own politics, his own everything. That's his community. But at the same time, all the Negro lives in a, in a separate community. It's a segregated community, which means it's regulated from the outside by outsiders. The white man has all of the businesses in the Negro community. He runs the politics of the Negro community. He controls all the civic organizations in the Negro commun community. This is a segregated community. We don't go for segregation. We go for separation. Separation is when you have your own. You control your own economy. You control your own politics. You control your own society. You control your own everything. You have yours, and you control yours. We have ours, and we control ours. They don't call Chinatown in New York City or on the West Coast a segregated community. Yes, it's all, yet it's all Chinese. But the Chinese control it. Chinese voluntarily live there. They control it. They run it. They have their own schools. They control their own politics, control their own industry. And they don't feel like they're being made inferior because they have to live to themselves. They choose to live to themselves. They live there voluntarily. And they are doing for themselves in their community the same thing you do for yourself in your community. This makes them equal because they have what you have. But if they didn't have what you have, then they'd be controlled uh, from your side, even though they would be on their side. They'd be controlled from your side by you. So when we who follow the Honorable Elijah Muhammad say that we're for separation, it should be emphasized. We're not for segregation. We're for separation. We want the same for ourselves as you have for yourself. And when we get it, then it's possible to think more intelligently and to think in terms that are along peaceful lines. But a man who doesn't have what is his, he can never think always in terms that are along peaceful lines. This new type rejects the white man's Christian religion. He recognizes the real enemy, the, that Uncle Tom can't see his enemy. He thinks his friend is his enemy and his enemy is his friend. And he usually ends up loving his enemy, turning his other cheek to his enemy. But this uh, new type, he doesn't turn the other cheek to anybody. He doesn't believe in any kind of peaceful suffering. He believes in obeying the law. He believes in, he believes in respecting people. He believes in doing unto others as he would have done unto himself. But at the same time, if anybody attacks him, he believes in retaliating if it costs him his life. And it is good for white people to know this. 
Because if white people get the impression that Negroes all endorse this old turn the other cheap, cowardly philosophy of Dr. Martin Luther King, then whites are going to make the mistake of putting their hands on some black man thinking that he's going to turn the other cheek and he'll end up losing his hand and losing his life in the, in the trial. Spends a lifetime begging for acceptance into the same government that made slaves of his people. He gives his life for a country that made his people slaves and still confines them to the role of second-class citizens. And we feel that he wastes his time begging white politicians, political hypocrites, for civil rights or for some kind of first-class citizenship. He's like a, a watchdog or a hound dog. Uh, you may run into a dog. No matter how vicious a dog is, you find him out in the street, he won't bite you. But when you get him up on the porch, he will growl. He'll take your leg. Now, that dog, when he's out in the street, only his own life is threatened. And, because, and he's never been trained to protect himself. He's only been trained by his master to think in terms of what's good for his master. So when you catch him in the street and, and you threaten him, he'll go around you. But when you come up on the, through the gate when he's sitting on the master's porch, then he'll bear his fangs and get ready to bite you. Not because you're threatening him, but because you're threatening his master who has trained him not to protect himself, but to protect the property of the master. And this type of 20th century Uncle Tom is the same way. He'll never attack you, but he'll attack me. I can run into him out in the street and blast him. He won't say a word. But if I look like I'm about to blast you in here, he'll open up his mouth and put up a better defense for you than you can put up for yourself. Because he hasn't been trained to defend himself. He has only been trained to open up his mouth in defense of his master. He hasn't been educated. He's been trained. When a man is educated, he can think for himself and defend himself and speak for himself. But this 20th century Uncle Tom Negro never opens up his mouth in defense of a black man. He opens up his mouth in defense of the white man, in defense of America, in defense of the American government. He doesn't even know where his government is because he doesn't know that he ever had one. He doesn't know where his country is because he doesn't know that he ever had one. He believes in exactly what he was taught in school, that when he was kidnapped by the white man, he was a savage in the jungle someplace eating, eating people and throwing spears and with a bone in his nose. And the average American Negro has that concept of the African continent. It is not his fault. This is what has been given to him by the American educational system. He doesn't realize that there were civilizations and cultures on the African continent at a time when the people in Europe were crawling around in the caves going naked. He doesn't realize that the black man in Africa was wearing silk, was wearing slippers that he was able to spin himself, make himself, at a time when the people up in Europe were going naked. He doesn't realize that he was living in palaces in, on the African continent when the people in Europe were living in caves. He doesn't realize that he was living in a civilization in Africa where uh, science had been so far advanced, especially even the astronomical sciences, to a point where Africans could plot the course of the stars in the universe when the people up in Europe still thought the Earth was round, the planet was round or flat. He doesn't realize the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the advancement and the high state of his own culture that he was living in before he was kidnapped and brought to this country by the white man. He, he knows nothing about that. He knows nothing about the ancient Egyptian civilization on the African continent, or the ancient Carthaginian civilization on the African continent, or the ancient uh, civilizations of Mali on the African continent, civilizations that were highly developed and produced science, scientists. Uh, the uh, Timbuktu, the center of the Mali Empire, was the center of learning at a time when the people up in Europe didn't even know what a book was. He doesn't, he doesn't know this because he hasn't been taught. And because he doesn't know this, when you mention Africa to him, well, he thinks you're talking about a jungle. And I went to Africa uh, uh, in 1959 and didn't see any jungle and didn't see any mud huts until I got back to Harlem in New York City. <laughs> so you're familiar with that type of Negro. And the, the, the black man that you're not familiar with is the one that we would like to point out now. He is a new He's the new type. He's the type that seldom the white man ever comes in contact with. And when, when you do come in contact with him, you're shocked because you didn't know that this type of black man existed. And immediately you think, well, here's one of those black supremacists or racists or extremists who believe in violence and all that old kind of, well, that's what they call it. <laughs> this new type of black man 
He doesn't want integration. He wants separation. Not segregation, separation. To him, segregation, as we're taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, means that which is forced upon inferiors by superiors. A segregated community is a Negro community. But the white community, though it's all white, it's never called a segregated community, it's a separate community. In the white community, the white man uh, controls the economy, his own economy, his own politics, his own everything. That's his community. But at the same time, all the Negro lives in a, in a separate community. It's a segregated community, which means it's regulated from the outside by outsiders. The white man has all of the businesses in the Negro community. He runs the politics of the Negro community. He controls all the civic organizations in the Negro commun community. This is a segregated community. We don't go for segregation. We go for separation. Separation is when you have your own. You control your own economy. You control your own politics. You control your own society. You control your own everything. You have yours and you control yours. We have ours and we control ours. They don't call it Chinatown in New York City or on the West Coast a segregated community. Yet it's, yet it's all Chinese. But the Chinese control it. Chinese voluntarily live there. They control it. They run it. They have their own school. They control their own politics, control their own industry. And they don't feel like they're being made inferior because they have to live to themselves. They choose to live to themselves. They live there voluntarily. And they are doing for themselves in their community the same thing you do for yourself in your community. This makes them equal because they have what you have. But if they didn't have what you have, then they'd be controlled uh, from your side, even though they would be on their side. They'd be controlled from your side by you. So when we who follow the Honorable Elijah Muhammad say that we're for separation, it should be emphasized. We're not for segregation. We're for separation. We want the same for ourselves as you have for yourself. And when we get it, then it's possible to think more intelligently, terms that are along peaceful lines. But a man who doesn't have what is his, he can never think always in terms that are along peaceful lines. This new type rejects the white man's Christian religion. He recognizes the real enemy, the, that Uncle Tom can't see his enemy. He thinks his friend is his enemy, and his enemy is his friend. And he usually ends up loving his enemy, turning his other cheek to his enemy. But this uh, new type, he doesn't turn the other cheek to anybody. He doesn't believe in any kind of peaceful suffering. He believes in obeying the law. He believes in, he believes in respecting people. He believes in doing unto others as he would have done unto himself. But at the same time, if anybody attacks him, he believes in retaliating if it costs him his life. And it is good for white people to know this. Because if white people get the impression that Negroes all endorse this old turn-the-other-cheek cowardly philosophy of Dr. Martin Luther King, then whites are going to make the mistake of putting their hands on some black man thinking that he's going to turn the other cheek and he'll end up losing his hand and losing his life in the, in the trial. For it is always better to let someone know where you stand. And there are a, a large number of black people in this country who don't endorse any phase of what Dr. Martin Luther King and these other 20th century religious Uncle Tom are putting in front of the public eye to make it look like this is the way, this is the behavior, or this is the thought pattern of most of our people. Also, this new type you'll find, he doesn't look upon it as being any honor to be in America. He, doesn't, he knows he didn't come here on the Mayflower. He knows he was brought here in a slave ship. But this 20th century Uncle Tom, he'll stand up in your face and tell you about when his fathers landed on Plymouth Rock. His father never landed on Plymouth Rock. The rock was dropped on him, but it wasn't dropped on him. <laughs> so this type doesn't make any apology for being in America. Now, does he make any apology for the problem his presence in America uh, presents for Uncle Sam? He knows he was brought here in chains, and he knows he was brought here against his will. He knows that the problem itself was created by the white man, and that it was created because the white man brought us here in chains against our will. It, it was a crime, and the, ones who, and the one who committed that crime is the criminal today who should, be, who should pay for the crime that was committed. You don't, you don't put the crime in jail. You put the criminal in jail, and kidnapping is a crime, slavery is a crime, lynching is a crime, and the presence of 20 million black people in America against their will as a living witness or living testimony of the crime that Uncle Sam committed, your forefathers committed, when our people were brought here in chains. 
And the reason the problem can't be solved today is you try and dress it up and doctor it up and make it look like a favor was done to the black man by having brought the black man here. But when you realize that it was a crime that was committed, then you approach the solution to that problem in a different light, and then you can probably, probably solve it. And as long as you think Negroes are running around here uh, of the opinion that you're doing them a favor by letting them have some of this and letting them have some of that, why well, naturally, every time you uh, give a little bit more uh, uh, justice or freedom to the black man, you stick out your chest and say, see, we're solving the problem. You're not doing the black man any favor. If you stick a knife in my back, if you pull it in nine inches and pull it out six inches, you haven't done me any favor. If you pull it all the way out, you haven't done me any favor. And this is what you have to realize. If you put a man in jail against his will, illegally, he's not guilty, you frame him up, and then because he resents what you've done to him, you put him in solitary confinement to break his spirit, after, then after his spirit is broken, you let him out a little bit and give him the general run of the prison, you haven't done him any favor. If you let him out of prison completely, you haven't done him any favor because you put him in there unjustly and illegally in the first place. Now, you have 20 million black people in this country who were brought here and put in a political, economic, and mental prison. This was done by Uncle Sam. And today you don't realize what a crime your forefathers have committed. And you think that when you open the door a few cracks and give this little integration an intoxicated Negro a chance to run around in the prison yard, that's all he's doing, uh, uh, that you're doing him a, him a favor. But as long as he has to look up to someone who doesn't represent him and who doesn't speak uh, for him, that person only represents the warden. It doesn't represent some kind of uh, president or mayor or governor or uh, uh, senator or congressman or anything else. So this new type, the fact has to be faced that he exists, especially since he's in the house. And he didn't come here against his will. So you have to uh, take the blame for his being here. And once you take the blame, then it's more easy, easier for you to approach the problem more sensibly and try and get a solution. And the solution can never be based upon hypocrisy. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad says that this solution has to be based upon reality. Tokenism is hypocrisy. One little student in the University of Mississippi, that's hypocrisy. A handful of students in Little Rock, Arkansas, is hypocrisy. A, a couple students going to school in Georgia is hypocrisy. Integration in America is hypocrisy in the rawest form, and the whole world can see it. All this little uh, uh, tokenism that is dangled in front of the Negro, and then he's told, see what we're doing for you, Tom. Why, the whole world can see that this is nothing but hypocrisy, and all you do is make your image worse. You don't make it better. So again, uh, th this new type, as I say, he, re he rejects the white man's Christian religion, you find in large numbers they're turning toward the religion of Islam. Uh, they're becoming Muslims, the, uh, believing in one God whose proper name is Allah, uh, uh, and Muhammad as his apostle, and turning toward Mecca, praying five times a day, fasting during Ramadan, and all of the other principles that are laid out by the religion of Islam. He's becoming a Muslim, and just as uh, uh, I think it was Dr. Billy Graham who, who made a crusade through Africa and came back and said that Islam is sweeping through Africa, outnumbering Christianity in, in converts 11 to 1, which means every time one African becomes a Christian, 11 of them become a Muslim. And then that one who became a Christian, he forgets it and goes on and be a Muslim too. <laughs> uh, so that, uh, uh, and Bishop Pike pointed out the same thing in Look Magazine in December 1960, and then Time Magazine, uh, uh, heaven forbid that I should mention that magazine, but Time Magazine... <laughs> Uh, Time magazine mentioned in uh, uh, two weeks ago that Islam is sweeping throughout Africa. And just as it is sweeping throughout the black people of Africa, it's sweeping throughout the black people right here in America. Only the one who's teaching it here in America is the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He is the religious leader, the religious teacher. He is the one that is spreading the religion of Islam among the slaves, ex-slaves, here in America. You have uh, 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 Muslims who have come to this country from the Muslim world. There are probably 200,000 Muslims in this country from the Muslim world who were born in the Muslim world. And all of them combined have never been able to convert a uh, 100 Americans to the religion of Islam. Yet the, it's the nature of Islam to propagate the faith, to spread the faith, to make everyone bear witness that there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his apostle. And if you find all of the Muslims of the Muslim world who come here, Inable or un incapable 
of turning the uh, American people toward Allah and toward Mecca and toward Islam, and then this little black man from the cotton fields of Georgia is able to stand up and get black people by the hundreds of thousands to uh, turn toward uh, Mecca five times a day and give praise to Allah and come together in unity and harmony, well, you'd have to be out of your mind to think the people of the Muslim world don't recognize the wonderful religious and spiritual accomplishment that's being achieved here among the so-called Negroes by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And I take time to mention that because the propaganda try and convey the picture that we're not Muslims, we're not religiously motivated, and that we are in no way identified or recognized or connected with uh, our people of the Muslim world. Well, if they didn't recognize us, we wouldn't care. We're not particularly looking for recognition. We're looking for recognition from Allah, from God. And if Allah accepts you as a Muslim, you're accepted. It's not left up to somebody walking around here on this earth. But those people over there would be out of their minds. When they found, find themselves unable to spread the religion of Islam, and then they see this little black man here in America spreading it, why they'd be out of their mind to reject him. And you'll find, if you take the time to look, that you don't find any Muslim today who rejects another Muslim. You might find some that who come over here who operate stores or, or some kind of little business in the white neighborhood, Christian neighborhood, and they want to get along with all the white people but all the Christians, they might say some words to please you, but they're only trying to get your money. So the, uh, the followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad look to him and what he teaches, his program and his message, as our only solution. And they see separation as our only salvation. Uh, we don't think as Americans anymore. But as a black man, with the mind of a black man, we look beyond America, and we look beyond the interests of the white man. The thinking of this new type of Negro is broad. It's more international. This in integration is always thinks in terms of an American. But you find the masses of black people today think in terms of black, and this black thinking enables them to see beyond the confines of a all over the world. They, th they look at the happenings in the, in, the context, in the international context by this little integrationist Negro uh, thinking locally, by his uh, thinking and desires being confined to America. He's limited. He's the underdog. He's a minority. But the uh, masses of black people who have been exposed to the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, their thinking is more international. They look around this earth and they see that the majority of the people on this earth are dark. And by uh, seeing that the majority of the people on this earth are dark, they don't regard themselves as a minority in America, but rather they regard themselves as part of that vast, dark majority. So therefore, when you run into that type of black man, he doesn't speak as an underdog. He doesn't speak like you outnumber him, or he doesn't speak like there's any harm that you can do to him. He speaks as one who outnumbers you. He sees that the dark world outnumbers the white world that the odds have turned today and are in his favor, that are on his side. He sees that the people of this earth are on his side, that time is on his side, that history is on his side, and most important of all, he sees that God is on his side toward getting him some kind of solution that's immediate and that's lasting and that is in no way connected or concerned or stems from the good will or good conscience in any way, shape, soever of the man who, created the, who committed the cr crime and created the problem in the first place. I would like to point out uh, quickly and briefly. No, I want to. I think my time is up, isn't it? Yeah, about. Well, doctor here says my time is up, and uh, I'm telling him his time is short. So <laughs> 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 so I think what's good for the goose is good for the gander. <laughs> there are many different ways to understand politics. Number one, we're not a political group. We're not politically inclined, motivated, nor are our political aims uh, in any way connected with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. But when you study the science of politics, uh, and, or, or study it as it's practiced in the UN at the international level, you'll find usually on questions you have those who say yes, those who say no, and those who don't say anything. Those who don't say anything usually are the neutralists. And by abstaining, they have just as much political power, if not more so, than those who take an active part in all uh, situations. Where the Negro in America is concerned, he's been, out, he's been without the ballot so long, today he, when he gets the ballot, he's ballot happy. He's like a man to whom you give a gun, he just starts shooting to let everybody know he's got a gun. He doesn't aim at anything. Well, we believe in shooting too, but we 
first believe that we should have a target, and then when that target gets within our reach, then we'll put the bullet where it belongs, or the ballot where it belongs, or whatever you call it where it belongs. But we don't see at this point where the black man gains anything in politics. Let me just give you an example. Uh, and in the last presidential election, whites were evenly divided between Kennedy and Nixon. It was the Negro who went for Kennedy, 80%, that put Kennedy in the White House. And they went for him based upon the promises, false promises, by the way, that he made. Well, facts are facts. He said he... he I think everybody has a right to his opinion. And, and uh, I, I'm quite certain those who are familiar with Kennedy's promises to the Negro uh, know what he said he could do with the stroke of his pen. And he was in, o in office for two years before he found where his fountain pen was, where the Negro was concerned. <laughs> and, the, and the excuse that he used was that he first had to change the attitude of, of Southern segregation. Now, he didn't tell you that when he asked you to vote for him. But once he got in, then he had to tell you what problems he was facing. And he didn't want to take a stand against the Southern segregationists. But he did take a, a stand against U.S. Steel, which is the strongest corporation on this earth. He threw down the gauntlet. He threw down the gauntlet to Cuba. He has thrown down the gauntlet to anybody he de desires. But when it comes to the Negro, he's always got an alibi that uh, puts him off until a little while later. So this is why we don't believe in any white politicians or anything like that can solve our problem. We'll get together among ourselves with these students who go to these colleges and get equipped and solve the problem for ourselves. Uh, I think that you'll find that the Negro leadership across the country classified the ultimate uh, 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 document that he signed as something absolutely worthless and so far as the housing conditions for Negroes. Just another political trick. Whenever you send 15,000 troops and spend six or seven million dollars just to put one Negro in the midst of some uh, yapping wolves, you haven't done that Negro nor the masses of black people any favor, nor have you solved the problem. Uh, if it was, if it's legal and just and right for Meredith to be at the University of Mississippi, according to Robert Kennedy, the Attorney General, and all of the others, then every other black man in Mississippi has just as much right to be there. So if you're going to spend all that money and all that manpower putting one in there, why not just go in and take the criminals who are responsible for keeping the masses out and taking them down off their posts and then opening the doors to everybody? That would be a solution, but they're not going to do that. They always want to use methods that put one Negro at a time. And then they use him to turn around and tell the masses, you see, we're solving the problem and the problem is still unsolved. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad says the only way to solve the problems for the so-called Negro is complete separation. Uh, in, and I, and, can I explain it, Doctor? Sure, go ahead. Right <laughs> The Honorable Duncan says, yeah, go ahead. The Honorable Brother Duncan here says, I can proceed. Uh, the number one, what Mr. Muhammad says is this, that uh, every effort on the part of the government up to now to solve this problem by bringing about a just, equitable uh, situation between whites and blacks mixed up together here in this house has failed. It has failed absolutely. So he says that since uh, you can't give the Negro justice in your house, let us leave this house and go back home. Now, at the same time that he says, let us go back home to our own people in our own homeland, the government itself is the leading uh, opposer toward any mass element of black people becoming orientated in the direction of home. They put forth the effort to, to uh, uh, stop this. So what he says is, since you can't give it to us here, mixed up in your house, and you don't want us to go home back to our own people, then the only uh, alternative is to separate the house. Give us part of this country and let us live in that part. You ask me to explain. Now, you want me to explain? You may think it's funny, but one of these days you won't. <laughs> he says that in this, uh, in this section that will be set aside for black people, that the government should give us everything we need to start our own civilization. They should give us everything we need to exist for the next 25 years. And, it, and uh, when you stop and consider the... You shouldn't be shocked. You give uh, Latin America $20 billion, and they never fought for this country. They never worked for this country. You send billions of dollars to Poland and to Hungary, their communist countries. They never contributed anything there. 
This is what you this is what you should realize. The greatest contribution to this country was that which was contributed by the black man. If I take the wages, just a moment, if I take the wages of everyone here, individually, it means nothing. But collectively, all of the earning power or wages that you earn in one week would make me wealthy. And if I could collect it for a year, I'd be rich beyond dreams. Now, when you see this, and then you stop and consider the wages that were kept back from the from millions of black people, not for one year, but for 310 years, you'll see how this country got so rich so fast. And what made the economy as strong as it is today. And all of that, all of that slave labor that was uh, amassed in unpaid wages uh, is due someone today. And you're not giving us anything when we say that it's time to collect.